All right, everybody. Good morning and good afternoon to all of those of you that are able to attend today. Um, like to kick things off. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box that's located down below. And we'll be trying to answer those questions throughout the presentation. We have a really great topic today um, about simplifying our complex cloud network environments. And I'd like to start off by introducing Jun Yi, who is a senior solutions architect here at Aviatrix. He has helped architect and build some of the most impressive environments that I've ever seen. Uh, Jun Yi, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. Uh, it's nice to have me in here and uh, wish that we can have a great session together. Thank you, June. Um, and those of you that don't know me, I am Josh Crittlebaugh. I'm a senior solutions strategist here at Aviatrix. And I'm very excited to be talking to you all today about what is a complex cloud environment and how we can help simplify those environments for your organizations. Go ahead and give me a click, June. So I'd like to start off just by introducing Aviatrix. Aviatrix is the only multi-cloud native orchestration tool in the market today. Um, Aviatrix gives you the ability to have the cloud expanded to your environments. And what we mean by that is we can run cloud natively in any of the major CSPs, be it GCP, OCI, Alibaba, AWS, Azure. We have built into their environments and joined in natively to them to give you the visibility and control that you need within your cloud. Now, some of the things that we can do just off of the slide here is we can help with firewall service insertion, SAML, site to cloud supporting for overlapping IPs. And the great thing about Aviatrix is it gives you a single management pane of glass and troubleshooting within the cloud, which is unprecedented today. Um, one of the, the things that I like to say about the cloud is it's, you know, it's a, it's a big black box. And Aviatrix gives us the ability to shine a light into that black box to see and gain visibility within those environments. That not only does it give us that visibility, but it's actually a, a great tool for simplifying our cloud deployments. And it allows us to, to, to use the same deployments in multiple clouds. So we can build something in AWS and then turn around and build that exact same thing in Azure, which currently using their models, if you were to build natively, you're not able to do that. So what we'd like to talk about today is how to deal with our complex network environments and talk a little bit about overlapping IP and how to make it so that our development environments can be deployed in a repeatable and highly cost-effective manner. And with that, June, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to you. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for the great introduction. So hello everyone. So uh, welcome to this uh, tech talk today. And so, um, uh, today we're gonna be talking about a scenario where one of our customers is facing us and then we have uh, been able to provide a solution. Um, so when we go into the cloud, we have always been told that the cloud is all about agility and easy to use and then Apparently, no one's going to tell you that, uh, you know, once you move to cloud, that you had to VIP your entire environment that, uh, you know, because you have an IP conflict and so you don't want to do that either, right? Uh, one of our customers got caught up on this overlapping IP situation, so we have provided them solutions. So um, this could be also used for other type of shared service model as well. Uh, as for the most of the enterprise customers, um, this customer has everything on-prem. And then they had the multiple domain controllers and for multiple domains, uh, certificate authority servers, app servers, and databases. And then um, now we've always been kept talking about like in move to cloud and it's about agility and ease to use. And then um, when you go to the cloud, you can use pay as you go model. Um, that should be automatically translated to cost saving, right? And then when we move to the cloud, then the cloud provider will actually take care of the infrastructure. So you don't have to worry about the back infrastructure, right? So then uh, this is the first time we actually move to the cloud. So on-prem, you have everything nicely uh, laid out, right? So you have your domain controllers, you have your app servers, you have a database servers, you have clients, and you have a firewall, and everything's looking great. Um, now, now we want to go to the cloud, then 
we just said to most the enterprise will do, just go ahead, uh, uh, first step, baby step, and then do a lift and shift. Simple, right? So we can just, uh, you know, um, back up or restore or do synchronization from the on-premise over to the cloud. And one day we just cut it over and then we're returning the original IP addresses and then ta-da, we're on the cloud. And since they're looking good so far, like for example, this uh, particular case, we're going to IBM cloud, all right? But pretty soon we found out that the IBM cloud is not sufficient, right? So there's so many other services there and then uh, you being talking to a vendor or application supplier that, that they build this custom app and then they say, oh, I need my application to be cloud agnostic. And, uh, but your requirement is that you want to use AD authentication and you have done your own research and you found out the Azure Kubernetes services uh, is cheapest of, of all, right? So then um, let's just build this environment in the Azure, right? Because uh, you have so many domain controllers as opposed to the Windows shop as well. So you spin up your uh, secondary cloud environment now in Azure, as, an, um, as most of the uh, domain admin would do, uh, because you have your own uh, environment in Azure, you have own subnet, and then now you spin up additional domain controllers in Azure as well. So now we're trying to create this VPN connectivity between the IBM cloud to the Azure using Azure VPN gateway. So everything seems to be connected and then we we'll get your domain controllers replicating our Kubernetes service is up and running. Your application is running right now and everyone's pretty happy so far. Now, obviously the story doesn't stop in here, right? So your business is growing, right? And then, then you come across with different vendor, right? So in this case in here, uh, the vendor said, well, we're gonna build this great application for you, but then now this time it's gonna be Azure because you know, that's how we've been using before, right? So. Um, and so we will have this thing built using the uh, AWS RDS and we'll be using Redshift um, as well as for analysis purposes. And then now what you're gonna do, right? So you only took your time to figure out how you can actually make the connection from IBM Cloud to Azure. Uh, then you took your time and actually did some research and you study hard and then find out, well, you know, we can do this connectivity as well, but at so this time I'm gonna be using uh, this VPN connection from this firewall in IPM Cloud to the uh, AWS TGW. Um, but in the same time, they have some SaaS providers that uh, that's also requiring that uh, your TGW to be shared out to them so that they can actually provide service to you as well, uh, or some of the other uh, SaaS provider who actually extend their endpoint to you um, so that they can actually use their services in their uh, uh, SaaS providing. Uh, SaaS providing. Uh, applications. So now you have everything built up in here. So now all of a sudden you're in three different clouds and then your head started spinning because now because every single cloud is different. Now you have to learn every single thing. Um, now, wait a second. So the developers come to you and the developers say, well, um, I'm developing this environment here as and now, you know, because of your customer requirements, uh, I need to have, really need to have a QA environment so that uh, I don't want to deploy my code to your production environment that, you know, without fully being tested. Uh, and also you have different vendors actually working now with your environment, right? So then each one of the vendor may want to have their own QA environment. And then they also do have the requirements that uh, the uh, environment has to be kept as much as possible close to your production environment. Uh, and as well as they want to keep the original IP addresses so they don't have to, you know, change their code. Um, now, fortunately, they do not require the QA environment to each other, um, and they do not require the QA environment to the production environment. But since you're in the cloud, right, so it should be quite easy, right? So remember the agility story, right? So, you know, um, and so you can just copy and paste, right? So you spend your time and doing your research, find out how you can actually create this uh, Terraform or ARM template or a cloud formation template. And so, and so that you can actually have all this environment, uh, you know, more or less will be able to recreate it in all the cloud environments. So let's just try to do this copy and paste, right? So let's try to do copy and paste. Okay, so you spend a lot of time figuring out that, that your Terraform template and then so you got your first QA environment set up and then you're pretty proud of yourself right now because this is like a great achievement. Um, and uh, 
use this to say that this is going to be a great achievement going down the road as well. So now we're trying to create additional QA environments in here. So as you mentioned before, then we need to have multiple QA environments for each of the vendors, for each of the applications. So this QA environment keep on growing and so everything segregated and so nothing's talking to each other. Each one have an exact carbon copy of each other and everyone's pretty happy. And until about two months later, uh, ka -ching. and then what's going on here, right? So your cost now goes way up. And then this is also pretty darn complex environment for you to uh, replicate. And, you know, whenever you want to make some changes, and so you have to change for every single environment. Um, and as well as because each environment is segregated from each other, so then onwardly, eventually, you're going to have this configuration drift. So QA1 eventually doesn't look so much like a QA5 at this moment right now. So what do we do, right? So we have a cost issue, we have complexity issue, and so we have configuration drift issue, then how do I tackle that? And also accountant is actually back on your heel, say, hey, uh, what's going on? Then we had to do something, right? So we have to somehow find a way to reduce the cost. This is, you know, you promised me that going to cloud, it's gonna be cost reduction now that your cost goes way up. Um, this cannot be sustainable, right? So that's why the customer come to us and then say, AVHS, what can you do for us, right? And then if you can actually do something for us and then great, right? So um, we took this uh, customer and so we actually take a look at then what's happening here. And we found out that uh, yes, uh, there are duplicated uh, resources that can be potentially consolidated. For example, all these domain controllers that you have in the QA1 environment, um, you have you know, more than one copy, so one in Azure, one in IBM Cloud. So you, because it's two-way environment, um, you probably don't need so many domain controllers. So that's one thing that you can consolidate. Um, and uh, with the Azure Kubernetes services, RDS services, can we actually get away with one instance um, rather than actually having each QA environment have dedicated instances? Uh, the answer is yes, then you know, we can try to do this uh, consolidation with that. Now, what do we do with this uh, duplicate IP addresses in case in here, right? So as you can see, the production environment already have that IP address and the same IP address is gonna be used by your QA1, the same IP address is gonna be used by your QA5. Um, how do you address that? So this is what we propose that, that we can actually tackle this environment. And um, now, Keep in mind that uh, the customer actually has this TGW because um, they want to keep this TGW uh, that, that to be shelled out to their SaaS provider. So in this solution, we still pro uh, propose them to keep the uh, TGW, uh, but instead then we actually spin up two transit gateways uh, in here so that we can actually create a transit peering between Azure and AWS. And then uh, we can deploy a spoke, uh, a, uh, spoke gateway in the, uh, Azure environment have that uh, the QA uh, shield services in Azure attached to the transit in, uh, in Azure. And then we also would actually do another uh, attachment from the AWS transit gateway. Uh, in here is actually not Azure. This one should be AWS, sorry about that. Um, and uh, then from the IBM cloud uh, environment, uh, we now have reduced footprint as you can see here then we don't have those additional domain controllers anymore, right? So we actually would actually do a um, site to cloud connection uh, to our uh, one of the gateway inside the QA shared in Azure, then we would actually perform an snatch so that all the traffic coming out from the QA1 environment because they only need to have egress traffic from this QA1 to access the shield services. Uh, then we just snatch it to 192.168.1.100. So that, that the QA1 environment is significantly smaller than the entire environment, right? So uh, we can now duplicate this QA1 environment and which has a much more less footprint to additional QA uh, environments. And then we can do the same. In this case in here, we have the SNET to different IP addresses. Uh, now one additional benefit is that because we have this transit created in here so that we can uh, chain service chaining uh, the firewall that actually can provide east-west inspection. And as well as we can have consolidated egress traffic so that the traffic would actually come out from one uh, centralized 
uh, a file word that actually coming through in this case in here in Azure. Now before that, then so you don't have a centralized uh, egress control, so that all the traffic uh, is actually going directly out through your uh, internet gateway or through the Azure Direct Net gateway directly, uh, which means that you have no visibility or no way to inspect that, and then it could be a pretty big headache if you're trying to insert your firewall into your cloud native environment as well. So this is very easy for us to tackle this problem, very common problem. Now, once more is that uh, we have all these gateways deployed in the issue of the environment and then the gateway is in the data pass. Uh, our da gateway actually do uh, collect your uh, net flow data as you send to our co-pilot. Uh, that way you can actually have a single plan glass to uh, visit all the uh, net flow data from multiple multiple clouds, as Josh was mentioned earlier, right? So we have this single management panel uh, for as well as visibility a panel for both cloud uh, for every single cloud. Uh, depend doesn't matter which cloud you're in. So the benefits of uh, all the solution is that obviously we achieved the first uh, you know challenge is that how we can actually consolidate this environment while as we have this overlapping IP addresses. And as well as we created this uh, mini shared service module for the QA environment so that uh, um, now that we would actually have a ripple effect to that so that uh, for the time to market perspective, because the QA environment is much more smaller than footprint than the original uh, footprint. So that it's a lot easier to duplicate the QA environment. And then also because you are using shared service model, then there's gonna be a last configuration drifting and so because it is shell service is gonna be that one true uh, master copy all the time. And the, also that uh, we uh, AVHS uh, do provide uh, telephone support so that uh, uh, the configuration of our gateways and attachments and pairings, all the stuff can be all automated. And then that's very easy for you to build into your pipeline so that you can easily uh, create your uh, QA in environment. And as well as we can provide uh, cross cloud uh, secure connectivities and we encrypt all the connections in between the uh, clouds environments and uh, between the uh, aviation transit period as well as from our cloud gateway, uh, the, the spoke gateway to the transit as well. Now from the operational efficiency perspective and because that uh, we are fully deployed with our transit spoke environment, uh, aviation is actually uh, do manage the routing tables and that's another routing task I, we've seen with a lot of customers that uh, you know with the service chaining uh, or the firewalls and, and managing the UDR sometimes is very challenging as and to keep the, um, the uh, traffic symmetrical uh, as well as as mentioned earlier that the AVHS gateways are in the data path so that that flow data is now being centralized to co-pilot so that uh, you have one single panel class across different clouds. Uh, additional um, advantage of this that we can actually provide some of the uh, troubleshooting tools that's missing from the native cloud constructs such as ping, trace route, and test connectivity like we can see whether the port is open or not and we can even do packet capture right so as in, in the cloud if you want to do packet capture is pretty um, pretty uh, resource heavy so that you can actually have you set it up to your storage account so uh, it's not as easy uh, to read um, per se uh, and as well, because AVHS is fully understand uh, each of the uh, CSP's native dialects, uh, so that uh, it will help you to from any kind of end-to-end -end troubleshooting in case something does go wrong, uh, or for traceability purposes or audit purposes. And you have uh, uh, vital information such as uh, your NACO security groups and route table latency and drop packages, stuff like that. And we have this tool called the App IQ that we can actually help you to do end-to-end -end troubleshooting and then actually show you whether there's a security group you misconfigured that actually dropping the package or uh, if they have a latency issue or not. Uh, as well as we can easily change the active to active firewall, which we've seen in the past that uh, many people are struggling with with active passive firewalls. Uh, we are, our orchestration uh, platform actually does that for you automatically. So to provide Active, active, high availability as an up to 10 files per availability zones, uh, as well as easy for you just toggle switch to perform either ingress or egress inspections across different clouds. So now there have been some uh, kind of caveat, especially dealing with uh, the, uh, the Azure directory in here. Um, in the Azure directory environment, that uh, the uh, 
computers or the domain members are uh, using this net lock on services. Uh, just like a regular user account, and you need to renegotiate its computer password every 30 days. So that since we have a clone, like carbon copy of those domain members or uh, Windows member servers talking to the same domain controllers in the shell service in QA environment. So this clones must disable this password change uh, so that uh, each one of them would have the same Kerberos password so that uh, you would not uh, break the uh, secure channel. And also we have uh, this problem that, uh, you know, it, the Kerberos itself by default would carry along with the client IP addresses. Um, so if you have clones and the clone, if they do change the IP address from, you know, one, one is different from the other, then we need to make sure that the clone must exactly have the same IP addresses. Uh, in this case in here, then we already have an exact clone of it. It has the same IP address, so we don't have to do anything. But if you, in your case, and you have to um, use different IP addresses, then you can implement additional registry changes. So to uh, make sure that uh, the Kerberos does not carry along with the client IP address or doesn't care about the IP address anymore. That being said, that concludes uh, today's uh, tech talk. And then uh, let's go to the Q&A session. Thank you, June. That was that was wonderful. Uh, we did get a couple of great questions in. Uh, one of them was, we are a full DevOps shop. Do I have the capability to automate this entire deployment of Aviatrix with Terraform? Uh, definitely. So uh, Aviatrix have uh, different ways to communicate with controller, right? So obviously one way is uh, the controller has uh, a web GUI so that the, you can go into the web GUI and just simply click and click and, and uh, that will get your configuration down. Mm -hmm. And also we have our REST API that's available for the controllers, right? So you can easily configure as in using uh, the REST API to communicate uh, with our controllers. And then we do also have our Terraform provider that uh, is matching with our API so that uh, you can uh, use the uh, ABHS Terraform module uh, to uh, communicate and actually uh, just tell the controller what to do. So definitely that's something that it can be easily integrated into your cloud, for, uh, into your Terraform template. Awesome. Now, there was one other question. Um, is there a service that enterprises can use to help with the migration from an AWS Transit to Aviatrix? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, it, we do actually provide something called the professional services. Uh, and then those guys are the smartest guys that we have around here. That uh, <laughs> They have all these tool sets, uh, strippings, whatnot at their belt, and then they can easily... Uh, analyzing your current environment, actually uh, reprogramming the route tables and then the, when doing the cut over times and they flip a switch and then within a couple of seconds and your communication gets uh, reestablished to a different route and then that will probably result in uh, even a single pin drop or even sometimes we don't even notice that, right? So um, definitely get in touch with us and then we can actually have you guys hooked up with those services that uh, if you need to do this migration scenario. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, June. Uh, why don't you give me a click? Um, and also a reminder, you'll be getting a survey here popped up. We really appreciate any feedback that you guys have for us. Um, and so just a, a quick next steps. We have a really great ebook. Um, it's a security checklist. Please check it out. There's going to be links put into the chat. Um, the secure multi-cloud network checklist, it will help you understand and build out and make sure that your cloud network is secure. And then also, if you have any questions or concerns, or if you want to talk to an architect about your cloud network, you can schedule a customized architectural design uh, session with Aviatrix certified engineers. And we'd just love to give a, a shout out. Aviatrix is the only company to offer a true multi-cloud networking certification. Uh, Aviatrix ACE programs are amazing. If you haven't gotten into cloud or you'd like to just prove that you know cloud, we have self-paced and instructor-led courses. Um, Aviatrix ACE, it is a, a great course. Uh, one more click for me, June. And we'd love to invite all of you to attend some of our upcoming events. On the 22nd of March, we'll be doing a similar tech talk to this, but we'll be talking about centralizing cloud inspection. Um, if 
any of you have IoT environments that you're dealing with, uh, please feel free to, to check that out. We'll be talking about getting that traffic back and inspecting it. And then on the 30th, we have our Cloud Pragmatist webinar, and we're going to be talking about using skill gaps to, to your advantage within your organizations. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending, and we look forward to uh, syncing up with you all later.